Hi there, and welcome to the screencast on Newton's Laws. This is a continuation of the screencast we're doing for IB Physics uh, Topic 2 about mechanics. This is the core curriculum. So in the screencast, we'll talk about all of Newton's three laws, and we'll use Newton's Laws and free body diagrams to analyze some motion. Let's get started. So Galileo, way back when, had this thought experiment. He said, if you have this marble rolling in a bowl, and the bowl was really frictionless, Right, the ball, ball would roll around really easily. In fact, if you let it go, it would roll up to the about the same height on the other side. Now, if you made the bowl longer, right, it would do the same, but in the bottom part, the marble would have constant velocity. Well, what if you made the bowl really big? Right? You would have essentially constant velocity here forever. He said, hey, this is what objects do naturally. Right? This is their natural state, constant velocity. And Newton said, yeah, you're right, Mr. Galileo. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest, and objects in motion tend to maintain that motion. In other words, they keep doing what they're doing. In other words, again, force is not needed to maintain that motion. This is uh, Newton's first law, or you might know it as the inertia law. Inertia is a property that all objects have. And it depends on their mass. So a mass is a measure of inertia. The more mass something has, the more inertia it has, the more it wants to remain at rest or remain in motion. Okay, take an example here, the Battlestar Galactica. It's moving at 10,000 kilometers per second in deep space. How much engine thrust is needed to maintain this velocity? If you want to pause your video and think about it a second, do that now. Well, the answer is None. We don't need any engine thrust to maintain its, its velocity. The Battlestar Galactica, if it's going at 10,000 kilometers per second, it'll keep going at 10,000 kilometers per second. Well, it might need to stop eventually, and in that case, it will need some engine thrust. Okay, let's talk about static and dynamic equilibrium. We'll see these terms come up, and we need to know what they mean. So if we have a ball on a table here, and this ball on the table, but this one's going to be moving, so this one we're going to examine the free body diagram. It's not moving. Velocity is zero. We have a weight vector downward. We have a normal force upward. Now these two forces act on the same object and they're equal and opposite and they cancel. So the net force is zero. This is static equilibrium. Static meaning it's at rest, the object, and equilibrium meaning that the forces on it are balanced and they cancel. The net force is zero. Here we have the same object, but it's moving now. We still have a weight vector, and we still have the normal force. Again, these two forces act on the same object, and they balance each other. They're equal and opposite. The ball's moving at constant velocity. This is dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium, again, meaning the forces are balanced. They cancel, but it's moving at constant velocity. Now, from a force standpoint, these two situations are identical. In other words, just by, if you just knew the forces on the object were these, and it didn't tell you anything more, you would not be able to tell if it was at rest or if it was moving at constant velocity. It'd be identical situations from a force perspective. So the resultant force in both these cases is zero, or we say the net force is zero. Well, what if an object is not in equilibrium? What happens then? That means there's a resultant force, or the net force is something other than zero. So here's an example of me on a bicycle. And let's say that the forces are balanced on me. So let's take a look at the free body diagram and take a look at the, the forces on me. I have weight, and that's at the contact points. We'll assume they're evenly distributed, so half on this wheel, half on this wheel. Now the, the ground is pushing back up. There's the normal forces. So in the vertical direction here, we have canceling forces or balanced forces, equilibrium in the vertical mo uh, direction. In the horizontal direction, we have a pedaling force this way and a frictional force this way due to the friction between the tire and the road or maybe the air resistance on, on me. So in this case, I would be moving at constant velocity because the forces are all balanced. The net force is zero. This is dynamic equilibrium. Let's say I pedal harder. What's going to change then? Well, we're going to ignore the vertical forces here. Those remain the same, the weight and the normal force, and they're just going to cancel. I'm not going to be you know, changing my direction vertically. I'll just be moving horizontally. So let's focus on the horizontal 
uh, uh, vectors, force vectors only. So we have a pedaling force is greater now, and a frictional force is, is as it was before. Notice the there's a difference here now. So we have a net force that's something other than zero. In this case, I'm going to change my velocity. I'm going to go faster. That is, I'm going to accelerate. Here's the definition of acceleration, if you didn't remember that. Well, what if I stop pedaling? What's going to happen then? Well, I have the frictional force here, and but I have a net force is non-zero again. So this is unbalanced. There's a net force here other than zero. So I'm going to slow down. My velocity will change, and by definition, that is acceleration. So it's worth restating this clearly. So let's do that. So when there's no, excuse me, when there's a resultant force on an object, that is the net force is not zero, then an object will accelerate. Its velocity or its motion will change somehow. In math language, we can say it this way. The net force on an object of mass m causes an acceleration a. This is Newton's second law. There's always a mathematical relationship. Yeah, I agree, Albert. So let's do a quick numerical example here. So here's the bike situation again. And let's say the mass of the bike and I are 100 kilograms. We have a pedaling force of 80 newtons to the left and a resistive force of 60 newtons to the right. So we'll have a, and we'll ignore the vertical forces again. Uh, the, the net force in this case is the difference, or 20 newtons. We know this is the relate mathematical relationship that tells us how acceleration is related. And if we saw, plug in the numbers and solve this for A, we get the acceleration is 0.2 meters per second squared, and that's going to be to the left. So I'll be picking up speed to the left. So let's look at a, some free body diagrams of an object not in equilibrium. We'll take an example of a student pushing a, a ball on a table. So the ball has a weight of 2 newtons, and the student pushes to the left with a force of 3 newtons, and there's 2 newtons of frictional force. So we need to find the net force and the ball's acceleration. So here's the picture. It has a weight of 2 newtons. It has a, somebody pushing on it, a force of 3 newtons. And it has 2 newtons of frictional force. So if you want to go ahead and try and draw the free body diagram for that ball, you should do so now, because I'm going to show you in a moment. OK, so here's the free body diagram. We have the weight of 2 newtons. We have a normal force of 2 newtons. Those two cancel. The ball is not changing its direction in the vertical motion at all. We have 3 newtons of force due to the push here to the left, and we have 2 newtons of frictional force to the right. Frictional force will oppose the motion. Now if we draw a simple, or even simpler, free body diagram, it looks like this. So this 3 and the 2 subtract, we have a net of 1 here, and the 2 and up and the 2 down cancel. So here's our, our net uh, force and our free body diagram for the ball. Well, we need to find the uh, the acceleration and the net force on the ball. So let's find the, so there's the net force. We need to find the acceleration. Well, we know the weight. So if we know the weight, we know gravity, we can find the mass. So we can find the mass and it's two tenths of a kilogram. Now that we know that, we can use this equation. Solve for A. A in this case is five meters per second squared. Let's take a little tougher numerical example. See if we can find the acceleration of the ball here on this uh, inclined ramp. Ramp is inclined at 17 degrees. Well, we have a weight vector. Say that's 2 newtons. Now, the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface it's resting on. So it's going to be 90 degrees to the surface of the table here, or the ramp. We can break up our weight vector into its components. This is a right triangle here. So we have this component, this leg of the triangle, and this one here. So this component is perpendicular to the ramp. This component is parallel to the ramp. And since this is 17 degrees here, this triangle formed by the table and the ramp is similar to this triangle we just made with our vector components. So this angle in here is also 17 degrees. And we can use a little trig. We find out that this side over here is 2 newtons times the cosine of this angle. And this one is equal and opposite this one up here. So the magnitude of this normal force is the same. And this little piece down here that's parallel to the ramp is the sine. 
Right, it's 2 noon times the sine of 17 degrees, and we know what sine of 17 is from a calculator, so we get a, a force here of 6 tenths of a newton. Now this is the one that's parallel to the ramp. This is the net force that's going to be propelling the ball down the ramp, accelerating the ball down the ramp. So we should be able to find the acceleration of this ball now. We know the mass is 2 tenths of a kilogram. Again, it's 2 newtons, it's weight, so it's not what's mass is 2 tenths of a kilogram, and we use the net force is 6 tenths of a newton. We can find the acceleration here, and if we plug in the numbers, we get 3 meters per second squared. Pretty neat. Let's talk about forces. Um, forces come in pairs. And this is important, and this is going to be your introduction to Newton's third law. So you can't push on something without something pushing back. Go ahead and try it. I dare you. So let's give you an example of force pairs. Did you ever hear of a boxer's fracture? Well, when a boxer gets punches somebody, right? somebody they punch, well, they certainly feel the force. Does the hand feel the force? Well, it turns out it does. And sometimes if you don't punch right, right after the hand hits the face, right, the face hits the hand. And if you're not careful, if you don't keep your, your fist straight, you could snap that bone right there and fracture that bone. So that's an example. So hand hits face, face hits hand. You can always find force pairs by when you have this action, hand and face, you just switch the position of them and put the face over here and put the hand at the end. And that will tell you the, the force pairs. So for objects A and B in general, right, A exerts a force on B, B exerts an equal and opposite force on object A. So here's some, uh, some billiards going on. Let's talk about force pairs here. So the hand exerts a force, call it F, on the table, because the hand is on the table. So there it is. This force is on the table. The table exerts a force opposite and equal on the hand. So this force is on the hand. Now we need to distinguish that from what we just saw before. But in this case, right, the force pairs are on different objects. One is on the table, the other is on the hand. So these two do not cancel each other. Only forces on the same object can cancel each other. As contrasting, let's look at the forces on this, uh, this ball right here. You have a, a weight force and you have a normal force. Right? These equal and opposite forces are acting on the same object. These do cancel. Right? These force pairs over here, the hand on the table, table on the hand, those do not. Okay, that ends the screencast on Newton's Laws. I hope that helps. Thanks.